So I actually really hesitated to make this video, but because of repeated debates that I've gotten into where I've had to go through the trouble of searching for multiple links and sources to make my point, I decided to put them all in one place. But before I begin, I want to make something very clear. I don't hate trans people. I'll call them any pronoun they want. I'll call them any name they want. I don't even care what bathroom they use. I had a trans roommate for over a year. The best person in my wedding was, in fact, a trans person. It's not about that. But there is another reality that has to be addressed. And that is that we gave girls their own divisions in sports for a reason. And perhaps, obviously, I have a little bit more insight into what this is like as I have a daughter who participated in wrestling at the national level and the sport of boxing and soccer. But um, still, one of the things that leads to me to wade into this fight is that Again, we have a situation where there's an emotionally charged issue that people are making emotional arguments about and are ignoring the science, lying about the science, misrepresenting the science, and more importantly, trying to cancel anyone who shares the actual science. And as you've probably come to notice from following my videos, one of the things that will get me to get involved is when people are actively spreading misinformation. So I have encountered a great deal of people who are still parroting around some ideas that are rather outside of reality, like the extreme feminist notion that supposedly physiological differences between men and women are solely due to their social conditioning and um, they say things like there is no basis for the concept of biological sex or gender, or whatever. And it's just not true. It's never been true. And I'm going to go over some of the science here now. But it's important, again, for me to clarify, I don't hate trans people. I support their right to identify any way they wish. But this isn't about preventing them from being themselves. It's about protecting the rights of girls to have the fair you know, platform to compete in. That honestly, the fight for that is still not even over. Women have not even completed their fight for liberation in this regard. And I know because I've been on the front lines of it in the women's wrestling world. There's still more to do. And now this matter has kind of jumped into the mix. So with that said, let me jump into it. So one of the things I encounter first when I bring up the inconvenient truths about this issue is that people are quick to try to discredit the sources. If you link anything that can in some way be construed as right wing, then they will simply ignore everything provided in that source. Well, here's the Washington Post, definitely a left-leaning uh, website and you know newspaper. Back in, I believe it was, yep, published February 25th, 2014. Interesting how different the news gets reported in such a short period of time. But this first article I'm sharing because it addresses the nonsensical, non-scientific perspective that supposedly men and women are biologically equal, barring any kind of social conditioning. Now, fit but unequal. Take two highly trained Olympic caliber athletes, one man, one woman. Here are some biological differences that affect their performance. Muscle. Testosterone and other hormones give him a greater percentage of lean muscle, particularly in his upper body. Some research indicates that even his individual muscle fibers are larger. Because more muscle means more power, men's top performances in jumping and sprinting sports, and especially weightlifting and throwing events, greatly exceed women's. The heart. The man's heart, because of its larger size, 
can send more blood per beat to working muscles than hers can. His blood also contains more oxygen-carrying hemoglobin. Altogether, his ability to take in and use oxygen, also called aerobic capacity, or VO2 max, is typically 15 to 25% greater than hers. That translates to greater performance in endurance events. Fat. Her total body fat is 16% of her weight. His is half that. Her body needs more essential fat just to keep all systems running smoothly. Estrogen increases the fat storage. These are elite athletes. Regular people's healthy body fats range for roughly 20 to 32% for women and 10 to 22% for men. Her extra fat is vital, but doesn't boost performance. So he is stronger pound for pound. Body fat accumulates in different areas of women and men's bodies. This is the body composition of each weighs 150 pounds. Knees. Her wider pelvis means her femurs meet her tibias at a greater angle. The higher this Q angle, the more stress is put on the knee joints. This is one of the reason female soccer players, for example, are five to six inches as suscept I'm sorry, six times as susceptible to knee injuries as male players are. Strength tra training that targets hamstrings and nearby muscles can reduce the risk. Give you a picture here, male and female. The Q angle is named for the quadriceps muscle in the front of the thigh. 12 degrees, 16 degrees. Flexibility. Thanks to anatomical differences, some of her joints have a greater range of motion, giving her the edge in gymnastics and figure skating. Hormones may also play a part in making the joints more lax. For the male, a deeper pelvis. For the female, a shallower pelvis allows more flexibility. He can generate the power to spin four times in the air, but she can do this. Now the uh, sources here are Barbara Bushman, exercise physiologist and editor of the American College of Sports Medicine's Complete Guide to Fitness and Health. I will share the link to this article in uh, the description of this video. But the point of this was to illustrate that there are in fact scientifically proven biological differences between men and women and that being biologically male during puberty is what sets the stage for this. The things like the size of the heart, the bone structures and such, these can't, this is not reversible with any science that we currently have. And that's how you end up with the physiological differences like you saw in the picture that I shared earlier. This is the issue that if we could fix, there would be no issue. This is the science that if you share it, you're called a bigot, a liar, or spreading right-wing propaganda, even though the Washington Post back in 2014, you know, printed, that, or printed this article, which clearly states the vast physical differences between two Olympic caliber athletes. This is the inconvenient truth. If we could find a way to deal with this again, Nobody would care. So first I have two articles from The Guardian, and I doubt anybody would make the argument that The Guardian is somehow a right-leaning news outlet. Trans women retain 12% edge in tests two years after transitioning, the study finds. Now, before I get into this, it's important to make the distinction that when dealing with high school sports, in many cases, trans women or trans girls, as the case may be in high school, are not even required to take the hormone blockers. This study is in reference to what happens after two years of the transitioning hormone blockers. A groundbreaking new study on transgender athletes has found trans women retain a 12% advantage in running tests even after taking hormones for two years to suppress their testosterone. The results, researchers suggest, indicate the current International Olympic Committee guidelines may give trans women an unfair competitive advantage over biological women. World Rugby recently became the first sports federation to ban trans women from women's rugby, citing significant safety risks and fairness concerns. But most sports still follow IOC guidelines from 2015, 
which permits trans women to play against biological women, providing their testosterone remains below 10 nanomoles per liter, a figure higher than average. Uh, biological le female levels, which range from 0 0.12 to 1.79. Now, the reason that the rugby issue is relevant, actually that first picture that I showed you when I started this video was an example of that. There are no weight classes in rugby, and it's a contact sport. It's like playing football with no pads or helmet. Anyway, however, the new study based on the fitness test results and medical records of 29 trans men and 46 trans women who started gender-affirming hormones while in the United States Air Force appears to challenge the IOC's scientific position. The research published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine found that before starting their hormone treatment, trans women performed 31% more push-ups and 15% more sit-ups in one minute on average than a biological woman younger than 30 in the Air Force, and ran 1.5 miles 21% faster. Yet after suppressing their testosterone for two years, a year longer than IOC guidelines, they were still 12% faster on average than biological females. The trans women also retained a 10% advantage in push-ups and a 6% advantage in sit-ups for the first two years after taking hormones before their advantage disappeared. But the researchers say they may underestimate the advantage and strength that trans women have over cis women because trans women will have a higher power output than cis women when performing an equivalent number of push-ups. The scientists conclude by saying more than 12 months of testosterone suppression may be needed to ensure that transgender women do not have an unfair competitive advantage when participating in elite athletic competition. When it initially published its transgender guidelines five years ago, the IOC said its overriding sporting objective is and remains the guarantee of fair competition. However, it plans to lower the testosterone limit to five nanomules came to nothing because the issue is so contentious. Instead, the IOC indicated it wanted sports to implement their own transgender policies. I'm going to kind of scan down here a little bit, but um, the academic research also highlighted the benefits of testosterone for trans men. Before taking the hormone, they performed 43% they performed fewer push-ups and ran 1.5 miles 15% slower than their male peers. But after one year, there was no longer any difference in push-ups or in runtime, and the number of sit-ups performed by trans men exceeded the average performance of their male peers. So that was the first article on this topic, and basically it just shows that even after two years of transitioning hormones, um, the 12 percent edge is is retained and again some of this uh, is going to be relative to the sport in question like there really isn't any way to make the rugby situation better but um, as was pointed out you know they may be underestimating this so now we move on to this article also from the guardian strength of trans women drops slightly after a year of treatment research claims Loss of lean body mass around 5% after testosterone blockers. Study raises questions for sport related to safety and fairness. Men have a greater performance advantage over women in cricket, golf, and tennis compared to sports such as running or swimming, according to new research, which also finds that testosterone blockers taken by transgender women only minimally reduce the biological, biological advantage underpinning performance. The study, published in Sports Medicine, found that while elite men are around 10 to 13 percent faster than elite women at running and swimming, the gap is between 29 percent and 52 percent when it comes to bowling, cricket balls, hitting long drives, weightlifting, and, ex and in sports that generally rely more on muscle mass and explosive strength. Performance differences larger than 20 percent are generally present when considering sports and activities that involve extensive upper body contributions, the study finds. The gap between the fastest record recorded tennis serve is 20%, while the gaps between the fastest recorded baseball pitches and field hockey drag flicks exceed 50%. However, when transgender women suppressed testosterone for 12 months, researchers found that the loss of lean body mass, muscle area, and strength was only around 5%. Therefore, they say, the muscular advantage enjoyed by, trans enjoyed by transgender women is only minimally reduced when testosterone is suppressed and small compared to the baseline differences. The results are significant because under the current International Olympic Committee guidelines, transgender women are allowed to compete in female sports categories 
if they suppress their testosterone before, below 10 nanomoles for 12 months before and during competition. Yet even when testosterone was suppressed to around 1 nanomole, it did not remove the anthropometric and muscle mass strength advantage in any significant way. Although the authors say the reduced cardiovascular performance may generate smaller retained advantage in endurance sports. The study raises significant questions for sport, with the paper stating the IOC may need to reassess whether its current guidelines for transgender women are fair or safe for female competition. They also ask whether, from a medical ethical standpoint, it is acceptable for the IOC to ask trans women to significantly reduce their testosterone if it does not deliver on its stated aims. Meanwhile, researchers also found the biological gap between women and men is so great that 10,000 males have personal best times that are faster than the current Olympic 100-meter female champion, as does the 14-year-old male schoolboy 100-meter record holder. These data overwhelmingly confirm the testosterone-driven puberty as the driving force of development of male secondary sex characteristics underpins sporting and advantages that are so large that no female could reasonably hope to succeed without sex segregation in most sporting competitions. So again, um, you can actually look up these studies, they list them, but they're in the Sports Medicine and the British Sports Journal. But it's very clear that even after the time period they're referring to, you're not looking at much of a reduction. And as a result, there's just no way to make it fair. They did mention also that there was a slight advantage at one point for um, trans men. And that brings me to a story that hits a little closer to home as it has to do with the sport that my daughter was involved in, which is wrestling. This is the story of Mac Beggs, a Texas transgender wrestler back to defend his high school state title. That was the name of this article, but Anyway, um, Mac Beggs was a biological female transitioning to male who in the state of Texas was not legally allowed to compete against men. Um, Mac Beggs alleged that they would prefer that they could compete against men, but that Texas would not allow them to. The problem is, is that Mac Beggs had a habit, according to their track wrestling account, of showing up at events where they absolutely could have entered the men's division or went out of their way to travel outside the state of Texas to attend wrestling events where they could have basically that were only a girls division. So basically the notion that they would have preferred to compete with men but they were not allowed doesn't really make a lot of sense if they're going to go out of their way to travel out of the state of Texas to girls events instead of traveling out of state to events uh, to compete with boys, which you're absolutely allowed to do. Um, Mac Beggs has now moved beyond uh, high school sports after winning back-to-back -back state championships in the girls division in Texas. They've now moved on to college and all I could find in their college men's season was two losses. So this begs a whole other problem but a whole other issue, which is that if you happen to be a female transitioning to male and you're on the hormone treatments, you know, these are things that actually get you banned from professional sports. You can't, for example, be on testosterone supplements and participate in mixed martial arts, in boxing, etc. And that's just like men competing with other men. The Soviet Union actually gave uh, testosterone to their women because it would basically pass through the doping tests, which were usually uh, centered on trying to find performance enhancing drugs and were not geared towards testosterone. So the question that people had is, would a trans athlete ever seek an advantage? And the reality is, again, Mac Beggs had several opportunities there where they did not have to go compete with girls and they went out of their way to do it anyway, uh, outside of the state of Texas. So we're kind of in a situation where things like this are just going to keep happening, you know, and uh, when it comes to what right do women have to be able to compete fairly, to be able to set their own records, to be able to uh, set a legacy for themselves. Well, that brings me to this next story of comparing the most elite 
tennis players for women, arguably of all time, competing against a sub, well, basically a, a male tennis player who was well past his prime. So this article was featured in Tennis Now. The man who beat Venus and Serena back to back. I was sitting there in the tournament office when the girls were saying they could be any man ranked outside 200, Brash told Filikov. I said, I'm 2 of 3 in the world, and we could do it now if you want. I, he had lost in the first round of singles and doubles, so he had been eliminated from the men's competition. So I had another five days in Australia, and I had nothing to do. The bearded Brayash, wearing glasses resembling swimming goggles and a baggy Reebok shirt, looked more like a mad scientist than a tennis pro as he squared off against Serena on court 17 at Melbourne Park in a match played before a few hundred fans without lines people, a chair umpire, or TV cameras. The quirky lefty's herky-jerky serve and masterful skill shifting spins and creating obscure angles befuddled the teenage Serena as Brayash prevailed 6-1. to one. This was Serena speaking. I hit shots that would have been winners on the women's tour, and he got to them easily. She's like, this next time, next year, I'll beat him. I have to pump some weight. Venus, who supported Serena from the stands, challenged Brayash immediately after the set to only a slightly better result. The German, who had a fondness for smoking Marlboros during some changeovers, extended rallies and deployed the same disorienting array of spins, defeating Venus 6-2. Both sisters are great tennis players and hit the ball extremely well, Brioche recalled in an account he wrote for the match for the Guardian titled How to Beat Both uh, Williams' Sisters. However, if you've been playing on the men's tour, there are certain shots you can play that are going to put them in difficulty. I was hitting a ball with a degree of spin they don't face week in and week out. Another key is to chase down every shot. In our match, we were putting shots in the corners that on the women's tour would be winners, but I was able to return them. In the end, I won, but neither myself nor Venus or Serena took the game too seriously. We were just having a bit of fun. Still, the man conquered both sisters in succession, offered them a rematch after hearing Serena's thoughts on the match. Apparently, after the game, Serena and Venus immediately told the press they wanted to challenge a male player again, Brioche said. This time, they revised the ranking of the man they wanted to face to 350 in the world. I informed the journalist who told me, this that in the next week I was set to lose a lot of ATP points and drop down to 350 in the rankings. I told him that if Venus and Serena waited just one week, they could challenge me all over again. Brayash learned what happens in Melbourne stays in Melbourne. That rematch never came about. When I saw Venus a few months later at the French Open, she came up to me with a big smile on her face and said, you know that thing in Australia? It never happened. Brayash recalled. So, again... Serena Williams and Venus are arguably two of the greatest female tennis players of all time. If they were forced to compete with biological men, they couldn't beat the 200th ranked, or 203rd ranked actually, male tennis player. They deserve to have a legacy of their own. They deserve to be heroes to little girls who want to get involved in tennis. You know, and this is kind of a textbook example of what we mean if we were playing because some of the weird solutions that people have given have been to just eliminate uh, the gender categories in sports nobody would even know who the Serena you know, Serena and Venus are like as in they would not even exist in world events as in world consciousness I guess would be the world way I would like to frame it and I just don't think that's right these girls deserve everything that they got out of the sport of tennis. And clearly, there's a difference. So, there's a lot of other examples of this, like um, powerlifting, for example. There are powerlifting women that are trans women that are breaking all the records. Uh, there's a female, trans female. Uh, world champion uh, cyclist who is talking about possibly going to the Olympics. And it's evident that this is just going to continue to develop. And people talk about, well, where are all these medals you're so worried about? And I point out to them that this is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, but 
give it time because this is just going to continue happening. So to bring things around full circle, again, I don't hate trans people. That's not what this is about. But the science is very clear that trans women retain their competitive edge. As of now, scientifically, there is no way to solve this. The body structure differences are permanent. The ones that you gain through being biologically male through puberty. And until we can find a way to solve this, it's just not fair. 